Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 852. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is April 23rd, 2024. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. This is where Kevin and George we sit down and we talk about things that we find interesting. Hopefully, most of it is Anglican slash Episcopal slash Christian slash uh, political news around the world, and this episode's full of that. We have 14 stories to, to deliver to you, so uh, if we find ourselves talking too fast, it's because we've got lots of stories to talk about, but that's the way it works with Kevin and George. George, how are you doing this week? I'm doing great. Uh, actually, I'm very sore. I had to take a muscle relaxant. I took yesterday afternoon off to mow the lawn, uh, pick up leaves, and uh, and I'm an old man now, Kevin. I woke up. I went to bed feeling great. I woke up this morning with my hand pressed against the back my back, struggling into the kitchen for a cup of coffee, moaning and groaning. I'm just turning into an old bag of bones. Uh, I, Some of our viewers think I'm an old windbag, but now I'm a windbag <laughs> and a bag. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm old enough <clears throat> to be a, a great, great grandfather. Uh, I was mm-hmm. walking into the RV the other day and we have three steps to get in. Um, and the left knee goes snap, crackle, and the, the right knee goes pop. <laughs> I go, oh, no, I'm oh. so old. So, you know, that's that's going to happen with age. Uh, I'm late 50s, you're early 60s. Um, but we plan to do this for a long, long time until we run out of news, which is probably forever. We've been doing this since 2009, I think. Eight. Whatever. Long time ago, George. Let's move on to some news here. You gave me the first story. said, primates are meeting next week at the Anglican Center in Rome, and which is amazing because since Justin Welby has been in office, the communion has not worked well at the primatial level. Uh, the primates uh, pretty much refused to get together, uh, and um, he had, well, we're not going to have a primates meeting, we'll have a primates gathering. And he called everybody into London, and uh, he brought he brought in Foley Beach, and uh, they had a little uh, tete-a-tete amongst the primates, and that didn't work out so well. Uh, he agreed at that meeting to hold the Episcopal Church accountable, and he said, "Listen, I I I hear what all the primates are saying that the tech should not have done what they did with Gene Robinson and all that." So. Uh, if anybody's going to hold them accountable, I, Justin Welby, will hold them accountable for three years. Uh, they are no longer uh, high status Anglican, so to speak. And so uh, that didn't work. He didn't. He never followed through on that. So now he's forced to do little get-togethers now and then. And this is he's calling this one "Let's Walk Together," not a gathering. What's going on? Here? Well, it, it's how we would, how I would describe. How oh, I that's you. I thought it was an official title. <laughs> now, let's no, get the dude. band back together. You know. Well, the um, at the last primates uh, at the Anglican Consultative Council meeting in Ghana, mm-hmm. uh, which was in 2023, the Inter Anglican Angl- uh, Unity Faith and Order, the UFO Commission was given the responsibility to come up with a way of reorganizing the communion in light of the fact that, you know, number of provinces uh, boycotted the Lambeth Conference in 2008 and 2022, that uh, the uh, primates, good number of them, don't come to these meetings anymore, that at the Kigali Conference last year, actually a week ago this last year, Mm-hmm. The conference statement said that uh, uh, we, the delegates, the bishops, the archbishops, the provinces, cannot walk together with those who have walked away from the faith. So we'll be tasked, the UFO Commission, to basically find a bureaucratic solution. And the bureaucratic solution is going to get its first draft at this meeting. And all signs are that this is a six to eight to ten year process. And Welby is trying is essentially bribing the archbishops to come. It's going to be held in Rome. First time it's ever been held in Rome. And why would you hold it in Rome? Because Rome is not on the Anglican uh, 
uh, itinerary. Yeah. The ad in the past, they've always held it at in uh, Anglican, you know, churches, dioceses all around the world, from Ireland to Brazil to England and all this and that. Mm -hmm. Well, they're going to hold it in the Anglican Center in Rome, which is a very nice <clears throat> former palace that was uh, uh, given space in the palace was given to the Anglican Church to have a little office there. Welby's few triumphs on the international stage have been around the fact that he and Francis get along great. They're best buddies. They're on the same wavelength. And so Francis will be trotted out uh, sometime during this meeting where they'll go see him in his rooms in the Vatican. And we'll have a, you know, not only should Anglicans walk together, but we Catholics want to walk together too. Now, there's a great deal of cynicism among those whom I talk to in the primates world, which is we've been there, we've done this, Welby's made his promises, he's not kept them. Hey, but you know, it's fun to go to Italy. I've never been to Italy before. If Justin Welby invited me to go to Rome, of course I would go to Rome. Yeah, he, he, and and if he's thrown in a free airplane ticket, come on, yeah, I'm not not fighting that. Kevin, but now you can come to Rome and you get to meet the Pope. Oh, I've been bribed. I'll do it. Now the Global South primates, led by the Archbishop of South Sudan, and Justin Bodhirama. Justin Justin Bodhirama says he's not going, but there are some Global prim South primates who will be going, and they're not holding against them for going, but they want everybody to basically realize that this is a show. There's nothing really of substance, nothing really happening here, other than we'll be trying to keep the whole thing together and unload the problems on the next Archbishop of Canterbury the next year or two. Well, I mean, we are getting to a point where there's going to be leadership changes uh, everywhere. I don't know how long Pope Francis is going to live. Um, he At the last Easter events held in Rome, he was uh, not able to participate in everything. Uh, Michael Curry himself has many uh, health issues. I don't know what leadership he has at all or voice within the Episcopal Church. Uh, Foley Beach is retiring uh, in June. Well, the choosing in leadership for him, I don't know when he exactly retires. And so, boom, th 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 those are the big ones that are going to be changing leadership roles. What pretends the, the church in the next year, five years, and ten years? It, it's hard to say. Well, one of the things that happens is, and it's a good thing that the eight, the UFO Commission is working on structures um, because they do need to be fixed. Um, there's no question about that. And even Justin Welby has said, yes, we need to rethink how we do stuff. One of the issues is the lack of institutional memory. Um I went to the, my first primate meeting in 1998. <laughs> okay. Um, nobody, nobody, no primate, no member of staff has the institution, it, it w was there from, you know, when I would go to all of them in the 2000s. Nobody's there anymore. They've yeah. retired, they've died. So there's no institutional memory. So when Justin, and that, you can see that take place at the 2016 primates meeting. That the primates made all this decision, and then you had all these retirements from the primates. Next meeting, you have a brand new group of primates, not all of them, but maybe a third changed. Yeah. And Welby is able to say, well, give me a chance. Let's just stick together. And the new primates haven't had the experience of being misled. So they give the Archbishop a chance. He lets them down one more time. Next meeting, they ask for a reckoning. But there's a crop of a third of them are brand new, yeah. and they don't, and they're, they'll succumb to the blandishments of uh, let's keep the band together. As we say. And the pop and circumstance. I am an Anglican in an African country, and I've been invited to the mother church. Holy cow. The, the pop and circumstance with that, oh, I get to have tea with the royals. Wow. You know, there, there's a lot that is built into being uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. You have uh, influence beyond what you need. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't, um, this will be in Rome this time, and it's a closed meeting. The press is not invited. 
we've gone to the past and basically doorstop as they say hang out and talk to our buddies uh you once had uh, uh a deep throat among the archbishops yes. and he would i remember he would make <laughs> telephone calls from the men's room yeah and i would stand and listen to you as you talk to him and you'd hear the the reverberations from his stall <laughs> and that that's the time when justin welby said that kevin and george were expletives uh, <sighs> because we were reporting things that uh, well part part of the uh, and part of the problem was you know our deep throats all left the day before the close yeah. and then they came out with the final statement and the goes who had left were deemed to have endorsed the, the, the document that they never saw or signed just because they didn't say no to it so when greg venables would take off early Mm -hmm. um, he's always put down as a yes in charge of ever, whatever they said because he wasn't there to say no. Yeah, and I think what happens is when we, when primates do retire, we don't really keep them on as great statesmen of the Anglican Communion. And Greg Venables is a, a wonderful great statesman uh, who came back and, and served some more in, in leadership um, and served that way, but like Arambi, Poof, gone, you know. Uh, Peter Duncan, Agnola, pick, gone. Yep, gone. And so you don't see or have them anymore with that lexicon of memory and shared experience of what it was like in the 90s and early 2000s in the Anglican Communion where they can see past the the Justin Welbyisms, you know. Mm -hmm. So, all right, let's move on to our next story. Oh, George has a trip coming up. The Global South meeting next month outside of Cairo. Um, you were and I were able to raise some money for you to go. We, we got the plane ticket. You're okay. I'm going to ask this up front here because you didn't have this in the past. Do you have your passport and do you know where it is? Yes, I do. It's in okay. my bedside table. I looked for it last <laughs> night and found it. Okay, good. And so you are going to go there on behalf of Anglican TV, Anglican Unscripted, and Anglican.inc. In order to be a reporter and uh, and to to find out what's going on, um, what are your thoughts about what what could happen? And then we'll get to the the, the story notes here. Well, the Global South is meeting uh, archbishops, bishops, some clergy and lay delegates from the various mm -hmm. constituents' parts, and they've invited uh, also in the, issued invitations to uh, a small number of reporters. Uh, those within the church world, um, including myself. And we not only are uh, reporters, we're also, I guess you would say, resource people, mm -hmm. helping them understand how to craft a message, how to, you know, we're not going to write their message for them. No, uh, but, no. but that, that would cost great, extra money. <laughs> one of the great uh, difficulties the Global South has had is that uh, their bishops are not media trained or savvy and uh, don't understand how the English uh, mind and system works. So this is going to be held at St. Mark's Monastery in the uh, suburb of Cairo called Sadat City. And I arrive there. I don't think I'll see the pyramids. I don't see I'll see, see the Sphinx because I get ferried to the monastery. Mm -hmm. And when the thing's over, I get ferried back to the car. But what, what is, why is this important? Well, the... As I mentioned in the criticisms voiced about at, in Kigali in Rwanda last year, um, this is the group that is charged with doing the political steps necessary to make change happen. Now, if you really want to break it down and remove all personalities, just take Justin Wilby totally out of the picture. The Anglican world is a, a relic of the British Empire. The Archbishop of Canterbury is appointed by the British Crown through the person of the Prime Minister. And it is a state church, meaning it has duties to the state. The Anglican Communion in Nigeria and all around the world and other places like that have no ties to the state. And they see their duty first and foremost is to being to God. Now, there are many in the Church of England who would say that there's no conflict in serving the state and serving God. Now that we are fighting over the over the homosexuality issue, there is a major conflict. It's uh, uh, it, the ferocity is akin to the abortion battles and whatnot that we have in the United States. 
And so the night, so the global South is basically saying, look, we need to decolonialize the Anglican communion. Having the prime minister of Britain today is a Hindu. Having potentially the next prime Archbishop of Canterbury chosen by a Hindu is abhorrent to the Anglican world. Not that there's anything wrong with Hindus, but rather the leader of the Anglican communion should be chosen by the Anglican communion. So they are, and the Anglican Consultative Council is a British organized, British run talking shop that does nothing except do junkets. Yes. And the Lambeth conferences have turned into farces where they're basically turned into either politely their graduate education seminars with trips for your wife or their re-education centers where they teach you how to learn the struggle against climate change, uh, uh, abuse. Uh, Implementing uh, DEI in your DEI products. and all this and that <laughs> yeah. stuff. Yeah. So what the, what the Global South primates want to do is put together something that can beat away the blandishments of the Archbishop of Canterbury. His call will be, oh, well, we've got this commission studying it. Give it six years, give it eight years, give it 10 years. And the um, primates are looking at the decline of the Church of England. They're looking at the decline of the Episcopal Church, the Canadian Church. They're looking at the struggles they're having with militant Islam. And they say, no, we have to evangelize today. Yeah. Not not six, eight, ten years. We've got a clean house now. So we'll see how this all shapes out. But this could, on the downside, it could be another place where we have fine statements, but no real ability to do action. Or well, we can have a quiet statement, and then plans are unleashed to change the entire Anglican world. In my mind, the most important thing they do is they have to change the instruments of unity. Okay, what the current structure is, Archbishop Canterbury, primates meetings, Lambeth, um, are, and the ACC. Uh, ACC are part of this uh, Instruments of Unity, and that doesn't work, mm -hmm. if it even really ever existed. And so uh, we have to change a new and put in a new structure. Now, I don't know what that would be in a vision. Some people talked about having... Uh, uh, a document that we all sign on to, so a covenant. Some people have talked about uh, electing a primus from within the primates. Mm -hmm. So, Andrew Atherston, uh, who's a historian in the Church of England and is also a delegate to the ACC from the Church of England, put out a very good article that we republished on Anglican Inc. Mm -hmm. that points out that this concept of the Anglican Communion and the Archbishop of Canterbury's first among equals is really a 20th century invention. We've mentioned this a number of times that the, you know, the uh, 39 Articles of Religion and the whole prayer book and the Reformation, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Canterbury was not on anyone's radar. And it was created uh, in the 30s, in the, the post-World War II era as the final gasp of control by the British over the world around them. And now that control has to be let go. Um, or if they don't let go of it gracefully, they'll basically find the smells smacked over the head and it taken away. Hmm. All right, let's move on to our next story. And okay, for you historians out there, you can probably name the one vice president who ran against a president, a sitting president. George, you know that who that was? Nope. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If memory serves, oh no, I, I put myself in a corner. Jefferson ran against Adams. Yes, you're right. I was I was thinking of Walter Mondale. <laughs> no, 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 no. I uh, <laughs> uh, just uh, you know I put myself in a corner. Oh, I hope we get that right. So Jefferson runs against Adams. It it doesn't happen frequently. In fact, it's very rare that a president has the VP run against them. And you pointed out a story that exists in the Episcopal Church. Where, let me pull up here, the vice president of the House of Bishops announces she will challenge the current president for office at the next general convention coming up this summer, George. What? Yeah, I, I meant to write House of Deputies, not Bishops, so that's oh, my on. fault, Kevin. Okay, well, I, I, read, 
Gavin re- read what I wrote, but that's not what I meant. Yeah, why would she be House of Bishops? Days. That's not right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, oh my, I'm sorry. Um, the Episcopal House, the Episcopal structure, the Episcopal USA structure is a House of Bishops, House of Deputies, mm-hmm. and the leader of the House of Bishops and the presiding bishop are sort of the co-leaders. Now, practically speaking, it's always the the presiding bishop who leads, mm-hmm. but the head of the House of Deputies has a great deal of power, authority, and they're even paid to do this job. Well, the uh, vice president of the House of Deputies, these two, uh, is a woman, a priest from Olympia, uh, Washington area, a mm-hmm. uh, diocese of Olympia named Rachel Tabor Hamilton. And she announced this weekend on a blog post, her blog, that she would st- contest the top spot held by a lay woman named Ayala Harris, who's a Hispanic woman from Oklahoma. Now, this is unprecedented in the Episcopal Church. Usually, my memory is, you know, the House of the President is elected and stays on until they want to let go of the job. And but now, we're having a real fight, and this is a case of the left eating their own. Rachel Tabor Hamilton is a very left-wing person, as is Ayala Harris. But the fight is not over their politics, but over competency and mismanagement. The Episcopal Church's higher echelons have been embroiled in management crises. For example, uh, the treasurer of the Episcopal Church, Kurt, I don't remember his last name. Uh, yeah. Kurt uh, <clears throat> has stepped down, and he was a black gay man. And the executive council began the search and they came up with a list of candidates and none of them were black um or gay and some i don't know about i didn't ask that question <laughs> okay. but i just looked at the pictures and none of them were, and members of the executive council basically threw a fit saying we need to have more dei not less dei we don't need competency to manage the affairs of the Episcopal Church, we need virtue signaling. Now, Kurt was a retired Wall Street banker, so he was competent and African-American and gay. So you had uh, the home run, a trifecta there. And in now, But a faction within the executive council said, merit and ability doesn't matter. We need to have someone who looks like us, or words to that effect. And Ayala Harris is happy with that. Ayala Harris uh, accused her bishop of Oklahoma of sexually harassing her. And the case was dismissed. And then she went out and put a public statement saying how terrible it was that this case was dismissed. Nobody takes uh, seriously charges against bishops because bishops are untouchable. The may whether be true or not, it probably is true. But that's not what the lay leader of the Episcopal Church is supposed to be saying or doing, denouncing the system that she's heading. So we're having a fight over dysfunction. And one, the, if you will, the competent liberals are saying, look, we got to get rid of these people we have just for show and have really competent people. And you can trust us because even though we're white, we're still liberal. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, to see, but it, it's interesting that uh, a VP wants to unseat a P. That's never been done before. N- never no, been not, done. Well, let's see here. I'll pull up my story notes. La, da, 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 da. Oh, we've now hit story number four of 14, George. New Jersey giving a 200,000 abatement out of the 600,000 that they normally send to the national church. Well, I thought New Jersey's still a rich little diocese. Am I wrong? Oh, it is. New Jersey is, I think, number six in terms of wealth. But they have a new bishop, and when she came in, she sort of checked the books, and she found that the finances of the diocese in New Jersey were in total chaos. Privately, they did a criminal uh, criminal audit, and the results were, no, there was nothing stolen. It's just gross incompetency. Now, there, I don't know if it's could be another DEI issue or... The wrong person was hired. A person was hired not based upon their ability to do a job, but what they would look like on the letterhead or in the masthead of the website. Well, at a certain level, um, I mean, I use for my company uh, an accounting firm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, would not that be something we advise for dioceses at this point, certainly provinces, to uh, use a professional f firm to do so? I mean, not Arthur Anderson, but... <laughs> well, it's very, expen it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. I mean, our parish has a bookkeeper. Mm -hmm. and But when we need to do audits, we put together a lay team. And uh, because we're not big enough and don't have enough money to justify having a CPA firm do an audit uh, or uh, or really do the books in New Jersey, basically did it internally and it found it was a total failure. Now they're at the point where the new bishop, her first real major act, is saying, look, we're supposed to give you 600000 this year. We can only give you 400000 um, because we don't have the money. And New Jersey, as we mentioned, is one of the wealthy yeah. places. Hmm. All right. Uh, let's. Oh, another text story. No, nope, I'm going to wanna... skip, skip that story because we, we're, we're falling right. behind here. Uh, church. Of, uh, okay. Well, let's go back to the Church of England. The Church of England has lost over half its, its children since 2003. We all know what happened here in America in the Episcopal Church in 2003. Uh, and that takes it from 154,000 in 2003 to 74,000 in 2022. That is atrocious, George. Yeah, in 20 years, the number of children fell in half, over half in the Church of England in Sunday worship. And adults are down almost 40% as well. And the question is, why? Now, is this all tied into the fights over homosexuality or women clergy? I don't know. We don't, you know, there may be correlation because these fights have arisen over the same period that these things were taking care of, were, were happening, but that doesn't mean it was causation. But what we do know is that if you have more than 30 kids, you're in the top 6% of churches in the Church of England. Yeah. At most churches, majority of churches have no children whatsoever. Now, this ties into a story farther down, so I'm going to sort of tie into it too. The clergy of the Church of England are going through a well-being mental health crisis, according to recent surveys and studies. Um, the amount of work is massive. And many of them are finding that their job has now become rush, you know, doing liturgy and filling out forms for the diocese and the government. And the actual work of ministry individually isn't getting done. And so if you've got a church with, uh, if you've got a benefice with three parishes, I mean, you can't stay for coffee hour because you got to run to the next one. You got to run the next one. You got to run the next one. You don't form the long lasting relationships. Um, you, uh, and at the same time, you've got you're being asked to fill out forms of uh, tell us about how your outreach to the minority community here in uh, in uh, in uh, on the Welsh borders. You know, it's it, and then there's the thing that bishops are not, and archdeacons are not leaders or fathers in God or pastors. They're managers. I think that's the biggest problem. You, they're there for it to be spiritual leadership, not just of the diocese, but of the clergy. You're there and you're responsible for the continued growth of uh, the spiritual lives of the clergy in your in your diocese. Nobody else is going to do it. You know, that's your job. Mm -hmm. And it's your job to be in, in contact with them frequently to be sure that they're not being overstressed. Um, I without revealing this person's name, had a very good um, uh, friend who's a priest since the early 90s. And he, every church he went to grew. Um, he went to a church in the Northeast, and then the Gene Robinson thing occurred. Uh, overnight, his church fell in half. And it was never able to regrow. And he always blamed himself for that. He blamed himself for the inability to make up for what happened with Gene Robinson. And that was a stress in his life. And when he finally retired, I remember having a conversation with him, and he still blamed himself. You know, I couldn't rebuild the church after that. Hmm. You know, and we lost 600 people overnight. I, and I couldn't rebuild 600. He, okay, large church. 
you know, and I'm like, oh, it's not your fault. Well, and your bishop should have told you that. I liken the situation to a rubber band, if you will. Sure. Uh, if you have got a rubber band <clears throat> and you don't have much tension on it and you're playing with it, if you will, and you let go and it snaps back, it doesn't hurt. But when you've got a rubber band that's under as much tension it can possibly bear, and you've got another crisis causing it to snap back, mm -hmm. when it hits your skin, it stings. The clergy of the Church of England are living in a time of crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis. Crisis over administration, crisis over monies, crisis over safekeeping, crisis over living in love and faith. And they are becoming, according to these research, demoralized. Um, God appears to be very far away from many of them. And to me, this crisis is, I'm not saying it's a crisis of faith in the sense of disbelief or unbelief, but so many clergy are being tested right now, tested by God, tested God has allowed these things to occur for reasons we don't know. And we are still called to be faithful. And that's really hard. It is hard, but we do know why God tests us, and that's to help us grow in him and to have uh, a real faith, a tested faith, to have a real relationship, a tested relationship um, with him. And without those, you know, what good is your faith if it can't be tested? If it can't be tried, if it can't have the elasticity uh, and resilience of a rubber band, you know. Kevin, you know, at one time, uh, if you opened a church down in Florida or in Texas, you put out a shingle within a few years or North Carolina, you're packed. Oh, you're packed. Absolutely. You didn't have to do anything. You just had to show up, preach a sermon and be polite. Now. Even in my own ministry, I've had to work harder to maintain the current population and to add people in a way I didn't have to work 25 years ago. Now, I still work. I worked hard then and I work hard now. Mm -hmm. But Christendom is Christendom, the sense that we live in a Christian society versus a secular society. That's pretty much gone. And in some parts, like in England, for example, it's definitely gone still holding out holding on down here a little tiny bit and you know the you know as we mentioned in an earlier story uh if only five percent of the population is in church on sundays and 20 percent say they're in church on sunday that really hits the minister because that core group has been peeled away the people who are your prayer partners who you need somebody to lead a youth weekend. You need this and that. Those Christians are dying off, moving away, or being burned out, or angry at what's being done and outside of their own parish in the national level. And, you, and the priest will almost always have to take up that burden. To me, this whole thing is demonic. Satan is a lion prowling around seeking to devour us. And he's doing a good job, and it's been chewing up a lot of good men and women and clergy. No, absolutely. Agree. Ah, wish we had more fun topics to talk about today, but that's uh, you covered the clergy. Okay, let's go overseas again and talk about the Russian Orthodox Church, the war in Ukraine. Um, it's been going on for more than two years now. You and I have always thought at some point. Uh, oh, it's it's going to be over soon. It's going to be over soon. Uh, and it just isn't. It's one of these wars, like all wars, uh, there's a fog and you don't know where the truth lies. And in war, there is no truth. Okay, let, let me put that out there. There's no truth in war. There's no way to really find out the stories until you have that war back in your history books. And then you can investigate what really happened. And we won't know that uh, between Russia and Ukraine for decades. But... I see a church war happening here. Yeah, it's uh, Nick Baines, who's the Bishop of Leeds, uh, reported in the past and is uh, reporting now. The Orthodox 
if you're on the wrong side of the battle lines and in the wrong church, you're going to be persecuted. Mm -hmm. So if you are faithful, if you're an Orthodox priest and Orthodox clergyman and you're on the Zelensky side of the, the war borderline, in other words, your, your parish is in Ukrainian held territory, soon your church will be made illegal as an enemy agent. And if yeah, you are... And, a, and you're talking about Russian Orthodox churches in Ukraine? Yes. yes. Right. And if you are a Ukrainian Orthodox church, clergyman or lay person whose church is now on the Russian side of the border under Putin, you are also going to be hammered. Yeah. And Zelensky has pushed through parliament a bill to criminalize and outlaw the, you know, the Russian Orthodox Church in the Ukraine. And Nick Baines is saying, don't do this, because, you know, we're this is heading back to Stalin times, you know, of criminalizing clergy for not being tools of the party. Now, I'm enjoying watching Tucker Carlson. I happen to mention this because I've always liked Tucker Carlson and I believe what he says, but now he's had one or two stories where I know where I actually know something about what yeah. he says. Yeah. He's getting a little and wacky. I know he's got and I know he's got the wrong end of the stick here. He's talking about Zelensky wanting to outlaw Christianity in Russia. No. In, in Ukraine. No. He wants to outlaw those churches who are not loyal to the regime, which is different. And meanwhile, Protestants in the Ukraine and in the Russian occupied territories are getting it from both sides because they don't have a natural affinity. They are asked to prove their loyalty. And if it's not proven quickly enough, zoop, off they go and they get arrested. I mean, try to be a Jehovah's Witness uh, and say, I'm not going to fight in a war with Putin's forces or Zelensky's forces knocking on your doorstep. This all comes in the midst of Moscow this past week, their Holy Synod, it's called the Holy Synod, has declared this war a holy war. This is a war ordained by God to bring, to cleanse Ukraine of demonic and evil influences. Um, I won't get into whether they, that's right or not. It's certainly not been well received. Um, but it's... Christians are behaving badly. There's no shining angels. Now, there's no side that you can say, look, they're the good guys. I hate to say it, but it's looking like we have two bad guys fighting it out. Um, yeah, I, I remember the, the Lutherans in the time of the Nazis, you know, and just, I, I close my eyes at that time and say, you know, we could have done a much better job as Christians. Um, and uh, I think there's no point in history uh, I, there are points in history uh, when fighting communism, the church kind of stood out. Um, but uh, in its long term, it seems to uh, try to protect its longevity over its message. Mm -hmm. And I, I, as a layperson, safe in the middle here of uh, New Mexico, uh, can declare that you shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> so... Ay, ay, ay. Let's move on to our next story here. Uh, Calvin and Galvin, Gavin. Calvin and Gavin uh, are at a, a little war of words here. Calvin Robinson and Gavin Ashington, who both been on at this program. Uh, uh, Gavin was a, uh, a not a co-host, yeah, a, a, a third voice for us for a, a couple years. And uh, Calvin Robinson is kind of a new celebrity. He's been around for about five years. And they got in a war over how pure is the original Anglicanism. Is that what I am? I getting that right? Well, you could say that uh, yeah. because the answers are yes and no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> who, who does St. Augustine belong to? <laughs> um, now, this war is they are not aimed at each other. So names are not named. And so they're fighting a good war in that sense of not personalizing things. Which is cool. I, you know. The Church of England had on its website and on social media put out a little history of the Church of England and it made and it made the statement that the Church of England is the unbroken continuous church from Saint Augustine and the Celtic Church. You know, we're the same people from then to now. 
Gavin Ashington's point was, wait, 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 wait. You deliberately re renounced that heritage, persecuted those who were faithful to Rome, and set up your own institution, uh, first under Henry VIII, but then formalized under Queen, El Queen Elizabeth I. So no, you cannot claim that heritage rightfully. You may have physical possession of the buildings, but you do not have its spiritual possession of the heritage. Calvin uh, Robinson responded with a detailed essay, which we've posted a link to on Anglican Inc., saying, yes, it is. Yes, it is the same church. And the spirit of Anglicanism is that reformed Catholicism that uh, at its best is the Anglican way. Um, I'm not going to uh, jump into this fight because I like both fellows. Yeah. <laughs> but I have to tell you, this, is, this story is one of the most popular this week on Anglican Inc. Well, um, it, it, this is not the first time it's been brought up. Yeah. I remember uh, a discussion with my college roommates back in the 80s about this very topic. You yeah. know, uh, who went wrong? You know, who went off course from the, the, the original um, uh, purpose of the church? And who, who was reformed? And, you know, certainly, well, it was Luther. No, hold on a second, you know. And in that... It's not the first time this has been discussed. I think that both men are bringing up good points. And I, I, I will not take a side either, you know. But I'm glad they're being gentlemanly in how they, they discuss it. Well, if, if I may, this is how contentious issues can be discussed and debated, where you lay out your points yes. in a reasonable, loving, and holy way, not trying to slit the throat of your opponent uh, who may disagree with you and uh, say they're either stupid, crazy, or evil, if they well, don't agree with you. I mean, this is kind of the, the magic of the English. They have uh, certain uh, rules, like Chapman House rules, where we get together, but you, you can't quote me. We'll talk mm -hmm. about anything you want to talk about, no quoting. And, you know, and I kind of like that about the, the English. So let's move on to the next story. And, oh, this is a tired story. Because in Africa, uh, as a continent, you and I have visited it many times, have followed stories uh, that are inside the church, outside the church, inside the conflict between Islam and Christianity for the length of Anglican TV. It's been a long time we've covered these stories. We've even covered stories that actually make the press over here, like Coney 2012. Remember that? Mm -hmm. You know, we've got to get rid of that, that uh, death spot. And he's still out there. Never worked. Um, and I pray for a day that these conflicts end. Every second week or third week, I get a, a email press report about another uh, shooting in Nigeria or Kenya or Sudan where Christians are killed in a continued Islamic uh, Christian battle. Um, mm -hmm. small little breakouts and this week is no different George oh yeah we had I think we had two or maybe three uh, some Muslim militants in the Congo mm -hmm. uh, Muslim militants in Mozambique and then uh, just yesterday um, a story uh, where Fulani Muslim tribesmen came into the town and murdered people burned buildings attacked Christians numbered dead the Nigerian army shows up and at, by this point, the militants had left, and there were protests by young people saying, where were you? Why will you not protect us? And the army fired shots and killed two or three people, wounded another number of others. And at first, the army said, oh, these kids were killed in crossfire with the, with the, with the Muslim terrorists. And then they said, oh, well, gosh, no, maybe they weren't killed because there wasn't any crossfire because the terrorists had left. But the officer leading the troop lost his head in front of the mob and ordered fire shots to be fired to break to disperse it. What this sort of thing does is it says to the average Christian Nigerian, not only have you be afraid of the terrorists, you have to be afraid of your own government. They're going to shoot you as, as quickly as the Fulani tribesmen are going to shoot you. And this is the sort of thing that breaks nations apart and starts civil wars. When it's not, when the army is not us, it's them. Your your country's army is them, not us. Yeah. And the sad thing is, Kevin, that that 
you and I could do a podcast on Christian persecution out of Africa like this with yeah. shows week. focusing only on this. We would never run out of material because yeah. it keeps happening. All right, let's talk about violence here in America. Um, a little history for you. And, and you went to Yale. You went to Duke, Oxford. Yeah, yeah you went to some uh, of these elite colleges that are going to make the news today. Um, we're going to talk about Columbia. My father, well, my father paid for me to go to the elite college. <laughs> okay, good. And so, um, yeah, you didn't go on the government's time. Let's talk about the original purpose of these colleges. I think Columbia used to be King's College a long time ago yeah. uh, and yeah. founded. And these were, were, were founded to be Christian colleges. Well, we Columbia are going to, technically is an Episcopalian university. I don't. <laughs> we are going to has put a together, Muslim Egyptian president right now, but uh, you know, well, whatever. Yeah, you know, in, in the early years of, of America, uh, they said we're going to have Christian colleges where we can make better educated Christians. Yale. It, it, you ever get a chance to read the the founding statements of, of the Yale founders? You're like. Where did that come from? They, these men are real Christians, and they want to make real uh, uh, catechists uh, of these students. And um, Harvard, no different. Today, things have changed. They have deconstructed their faith, and it's it's something to watch uh, because this has gone beyond like the '60s protests of war. This is this has entered a realm of hate and phobia over the Jews. And you and I need to talk about it because it's a, it's a religion story, George. Um, I was watching the news. Columbia uh, told students it's time to work from home. Don't come to school this week until we get this all worked out because of the continued protests that are going on on campus and um, the vitriol that this group of students have for the Jewish students. I watched Yale where they block were blocking. Jewish students from going to classes. They, they formed a, a human chain of, of protesters not allowing uh, Jew, Jewish students to go into the buildings to attend classes. Yeah, you and I have seen Nazi pictures of the same many uh, generations ago. Uh, wh where, did, where did this come from? Where did we find innocent minds and corrupt them so bad that they have no understanding of what is really happening in the Middle East? TikTok. It's crazy. Little anecdote. Yeah. I, I was very close to one professor when I was at Yale named Brevard Childs, who was an mm -hmm. Old Testament scholar, and his wife as well. And I'd be over at their house oh, maybe every other week for you know lunch or, or a dinner with my wife and a bunch of other kids. And Mrs. Childs would say during the riots of the 60s, during the Vietnam War protest, she and another group, she and uh, as a member of the Faculty Wives Club, would make tuna fish sandwiches and go down to the Yale Quadrangle while the children were protesting Vietnam and hand out peanut butter and jelly and tuna fish sandwiches to the protesters. Mm -hmm. Today, uh, there was a Jewish uh, girl uh, who's the editor of the Yale Free Press, which is the alternative newspaper at Yale. She's Jewish and another Yale student poked her eye with a Yale with a Palestinian flag. And she hadn't provoked anything, but she was just offensively Jewish. She happened to be Orthodox Jews. And so she was wearing a dress and, you know, her legs were covered and, you know, up to her sleeve, you know, her sleeves up to her wrists sort of thing. And she was known to be Jewish and she was attacked. I don't think any faculty wives are making tuna fish sandwiches for these characters because there's a degree of viciousness and anger and hatred and vitriol. And as you mentioned, Kevin, these started out as Christian institutions. Right next to Yale, is, uh, right next to uh, Columbia is the Episcopal Church's Cathedral St. John the Divine for yeah. New York City. Union Theological Seminary is there on the campus. Um, now, you can say Union stopped being Christian a long time ago but you know, there's, these areas are heavy with churches and church groups. And the one thing I have not seen are the churches or the clergy standing up in solidarity with Jews being attacked. 
uh, Jordan Peterson once had a line that everybody likes to think there'll be Oscar Schindler in the situation, but most people will be concentration camp guards. That's true. I mean, so the same. So the people who are protesting, you know, loudly in their online, in their blogs about the environment, about lesbian and gay rights, about black, you know, black lives matter. They're perfectly happy to see the Jew victimized and terrorized, and they're not going to stand in the stand with them in solidarity. And this is the place that I complain about most because the church has lost its voice here. You have the, the leadership of the denominations of uh, every major denomination uh, has been silent on this topic. Silent so much it, that even if they spoke now, nobody would listen. Because, oh, you can talk now? Well, where were you uh, five days ago, a week ago? Where were you October 7th? Where, where were you, you know, uh, when things really got bad? It would be ridiculous to think that things are just getting bad now. Things were getting bad months ago, years ago, almost a decade ago, when we started introducing uh, wokeness to our universities and DEI to our hiring and um, just this, this communist influence into the lives of school children uh, and college kids who don't know any better. And this is what you're stuck with now until you can stand up and... and reclaim the church as a voice in culture imagine what the liberal people church leaders in particular would do if we change the nouns in these uh protests that are you can see them on film it's all it we're not making up anything instead of jews go back jews out uh or jews go to israel you know jews get out of here you're not welcome here you had uh the Ku Klux Klan holding up signs saying, go back to Africa, whites sure. only, or uh, no gay people here, you know, whatever. But I, I will make one little thing is that, Kevin, where you and I are, I don't know about Santa Fe, where you are today, but I would assume, but I can certainly tell you where I am. I drive around here, half the churches have a little pray for Israel sign. Um, the vehemence and the violence and the hatred that we see arising for Jews in our culture is not evenly spread geographically. I hate to sound like Mr. Booster of Florida, but you know, the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, basically put out a little warning to the state university system. If I get even a whiff of this, we'll have new presidents and we'll have fewer <laughs> students in those schools. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and so there's been no been no nastiness like that down here. Florida, for the most part, maybe Miami and Tampa Bay is a safe place mm -hmm. uh, for those who who are reasoned. Um, in my travels, um, I discover that there are cities that have completely surrendered to the the rainbow flag, the uh, the the cult of Q. I call it the cult of the cult of uh, queer, and in a such, some, you know, I, if America survives and the West survives, somebody in 100 years or in 200 years is going to write a book called um, This Flag Was the Foreshadowing of All Bad. And that's the rainbow flag. Okay, just look at what we have to accept with that flag. And, you know... We have to accept redefinition of everything. And, well, you, you know, you can't do that because it's cultural re uh, appropriation. Well, you have gender appropriation. Ah, oh, that's different. No, 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 no. You know, just like, it, you know, we can't do this in, in 15, 20, 30. We, we could have a separate podcast just about the cult of queer or the cult of Q. And I hope uh, YouTube doesn't censor me for just saying that, but... Uh, uh, the Cult of Q could be its own separate uh, podcast talking not just about the news every week, but how to reclaim our Western culture, how to reclaim um, Christianity, how to reclaim reason and science and biology and, and um, philosophy again. We've lost all that in 15, 20 short years, George. And well, it takes what I call the Jordan Peterson approach which is 
an individual saying, I'm not going to play that game anymore. Yeah. I'm not going to pretend that this person who's wearing a dress who thinks there's a woman, I'm not going to pretend and accept the fact that they claim to be a woman when I know that to be a lie. Okay. Rod Dreher, uh, the columnist Rod Dreher has a little sure. mantra, live not by lies. Mm -hmm. And we live by so many lies in our culture today yeah. and so many lies in our church today that it's just... It begins with the individual saying, I'm not going to lie anymore. It's not a phobia. You know, it, it's it's what we've learned over centuries, you know, that it, it's not a phobia. Some people do have the phobia, but it's not a phobia. All right here, Indian, are we going to do an Indian story? If you really want to, Kevin. Oh, I, I, I will say that for some other time. But we got a great episode. We're up to 56 minutes. Um, like I said, we've raised money for George to go over to um, Cairo to attend this. We could use a, a little bit more, um, but we got enough for plane tickets and, uh, and, and some food, stuff like that. But uh, maybe a couple hundred extra would be a buffer. Uh, we're also sending you to the provincial... Uh, uh, conference in June up in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. Kevin, why aren't you going to all these things? I, I'm going to a Dyson convention at, at the end of May on Memorial Day weekend, and you'll see more of that as it up comes. Um, but uh, I'm doing stuff. George is doing stuff. It's still Anglican, unscripted, everywhere, all the time. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 852 of Anglican Unscripted.